Coming in at number 5 we have Portrait of Samantha Houston. On the surface this painting seems like a sweet portrait of a little girl, though this painting has a dark story behind it. This deceptive painting by Richard King hangs in Austin, Texas's Driscoll Hotel and carries a haunting legend with it. The girl in the photo is named Samantha Houston and was the daughter of a senator in Texas. Samantha's father brought her with him when he stayed at the Driscoll Hotel in 1887. This would be where Samantha fell down a flight of stairs while chasing after a bull and would fall to her death. After the tragic accident, Samantha's father hired the artist Richard Kind to paint a grand portrait of Samantha to commemorate her death. For unknown reasons, Samantha's father never went to pick up the painting. Thus, after it was finished, the Driscoll Hotel purchased the painting for $10 and displayed it at the head of the grand staircase. The painting by Richard King would be hung in the hotel where she died and is known to have focused on the spirit's alleged activities. Since the accident, it is reported that her ghost haunts the Driscoll Hotel. It has been reported that a bouncing ball can often be seen in the hotel lobby. Additionally, there have been guest complaints that door handles beside the painting painting rattle, with guests also saying that Samantha's expression in the painting seems to distort as they look at it. In the painting, Samantha holds flowers and looks innocent, but it has been said by present day hotel staff and guests that if you stare at the painting long enough, her expression changes. Sometimes her mouth appears to widen into a full smile, and other times her face would contour. Not only that, but there have also been guest reports of feeling nauseous or a falling feeling around the painting, as if they too are tumbling down a set of stairs. In 19 in 1906, Samantha's mother donated separate portraits of herself and her husband to be hung together side by side with their daughter, though the parents painting kept falling off the wall for no apparent reason, having it be nailed to the wall. The parents painting would be vandalised and slashed, leaving the hotel to have both paintings copied and hung without labels, with the fear that they would get vandalised again. Today no one knows where the original paintings are. In at number 4 we have the dead mother. Most famous for his painting titled The Scream, Edvard Munch is not new to dark and scary paintings. The 1800s painter is a fairly dark individual and was driven to insanity for his terrible upbringing. The Dead Mother is one of his most haunting art pieces. The painting is to honour Munch's mother who died of tuberculosis when Munch was a young boy. The painting reflects some of the angst, despair and insanity that Edvard went through growing up. These elements are used to form what can only be described as a truly disturbing painting to look at. The painting depicts a young girl with her back turned to a bed on which her dead mother lies as she holds her hands to her ears with a wide eyed expression of disbelief. The emotions of frozen time, disbelief and trauma a child may have following a parent's death are expressed in this painting. And these emotions never left him as he experienced them firsthand. Some would say that contrary to the girl's distraught pose, the faraway look in the eyes show that she has already broken free from reality. It is as if she is trying to block out the stillness of the room, or the news that her mother is gone forever. The little girl's eyes have been reported to follow viewers as they move around her and some people can even hear the sheets from the dead mother's bed rustling as they stand near the painting. The piece of art is now maintained at the Kunsthalle in Bremen, but the trauma and despair make the painting still haunting to look at today. In at number 3 we have Man Proposes, God Disposes. The 1800 paintings by Sir Edwin Landseer could be one of the most mysterious and haunting one there is. The painting shows two polar bears savagely attacking human remains. The painting was to depict the mysterious and terrifying tales of Sir John Franklin's failed expedition to find the Northwest Passage. Finding the passage was very important in the eyes of British merchants and sailors in the 19th century because it would link the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, and cut the length of the trip and inevitably strengthen British imperial power. Franklin was a very experienced explorer and set off on his expedition with 129 men and two navy ships, but after three years there were no word from him. There were countless searches and missions to try and find the missing crew and ships. During one mission in 1854, they spoke to the local Inuit community, who met with some of the remaining crew after they had to abandon their ship. And after 10 years, the only thing they could find were objects from the expedition, including Franklin's telescope seen in the painting. Most gruesome, however, was their discovery of bones belonging to members of the crew. This mysterious disappearance of the crew and their failed expedition is not only the haunting part about the painting, though. As the picture is displayed at Royal Holloway University of London, where it has to be covered with a Union flag during exam season. This is due to the fact that in the 1970s there was a rumour of a student taking their own life after staring at 
at the painting for too long. The student allegedly left a note behind saying the polar bears made me do it, while other students reported feeling uneasy and upset while sitting next to it. In at number 2 we have Pogo the Clown. During the early 1970s John Wayne Gacy was considered a loving husband and a successful restaurant manager. He was seen as an active and important community member as he would dress up as a clown at events to raise money for local charities. His clown alter ego was called Pogo the Clown, where many sick kids in local hospitals would receive visits from Pogo. John was seen as a normal and kind man until the truth about his alter ego came to the surface. Under the floorboards of his house there were discovered remains of people he took the life of. After John was exposed for his criminal behaviour he was convicted and imprisoned on death row. In prison John began to oil paint. When people would view his painting they would feel a mix of repulsion and intrigue. One piece in particular is known to fully represent John's murderous instinct called Pogo the Clown. In 2001 the painting would be purchased by singer Nicky Stone for $3000. Shortly after purchasing the painting Nicky noticed a string of accidents and tragedies following him. This being his dog suddenly passing away and then his mother falling sick. Alarmed with the sudden bad news he arranged to have the painting stored at a friends house instead. While it was in the hands of the friend a close neighbour passed in a car accident. The painting would be later handed over to another friend until the eeriness of the painting would haunt the man until he went mad. Stone the original owner of the painting had no choice but to sell it for all of the negative energy that it brought to each person that it was handed over to. Finally coming in at number 1 we have Untitled by Zdzislaw Beksinski. One of the most visually frightening paintings on this list we have the Zdzislaw Beksinski untitled painting that looks like a scene straight out of a nightmare. Not only does it look terrifying but the legend surrounding the painting is also not for the faint hearted. Many people believe that the painting is cursed. The Polish painter did not title any of his paintings because he wanted to avoid any metaphorical interpretation of his paintings. He also reportedly burned a selection of his artworks in his backyard before anyone could ever see them. As an artist Beskinski was fascinated with death, decay and darkness. But those weren't his only fascinations. Therefore his work had dark decaying and gruesome images. Beskinski's life was filled with tragedy after his wife suddenly passed and just a year later his son would follow. Six years after these horrible accidents the artist himself was found unalive in his apartment. Understandably his tragic last year have since often been linked with the grimness of his art because of all of the death and bad luck that followed the artist's painting. It's believed that anyone that looked at the painting for too long would soon be met with the same fate as Beskinski's family. In at number 5 we have the stagecraft. This eerie painting was an adaptation of a photograph that was taken by photographer James Kidd. The photo was taken of a wooden car and when the picture was finally developed it shows a ghostly figure of a headless man standing on a log to the left of the wagon. The figure's coat, pants and boots are quite plain and easy to see but he has no head. The photograph was examined by Kodak and other experts and it was proved that this photo was not tampered with in any way. In 1994 James Kidd displayed his photo at a gallery in Tombstone Arizona and painter Laura who was also showing off her art at the gallery saw the stagecraft photo and was very intrigued. Laura asked James if she could make an oil painting of the photo. He said she could and she began to work on the 16 by 20 inch oil painting based on the photo. When she was about halfway through completing the painting she began getting a strange feeling and Laura thought to herself why she chose that photo to paint or maybe she shouldn't have even started it but she did finish it. After completion of the painting some very strange and unexplainable things began to happen around her home seemingly centered around that painting. Laura says she doesn't believe in ghosts but she isn't able to explain how or why these strange things happened. She took the painting to hang it in the office she worked at and three days after doing that the office called and asked her to come pick up the ghost painting. Every morning people claimed the painting was crooked. They would straighten it and the next morning it would be crooked again. Also appointments were suddenly messed up and papers went missing. People in the office were very afraid of the painting so Laura took it back to her house. Since she took it home her and her husband would experience weird occurrences like knocks on the door but no one was there. Seeing a white hazy figure of a person, a clock which hung on the wall for over 40 years suddenly fell and broke, mysterious leaks in their roof and even though it was brand new and looked at multiple times by workers who said nothing was wrong with it. Many weird things happened not only to them but also to friends of theirs who would come over or just look at the photo. 
Toronto. Laura claims even after all of these unexplainable experiences, she still doesn't believe in ghosts, but if she could go back, she would never have created the painting. In at number 4 we have The Rain Woman. The Rain Woman was painted in 1996 by a Ukraine artist by the name of Svetlana Telets. One day she began to feel as if someone was always with her, and one day she had the urge to draw and she believed she captured who was watching over her. During the creation of the painting, she felt that a hand was guiding her during the entire process and had finished The Rain Woman in less than 5 hours. After finishing the painting, it was put on the market and was bought but then quickly bought back, which occurred many times by different purchases of The Rain Woman. The first woman who bought it claimed she couldn't get any sleep and felt someone was beside her even after hiding the painting behind a cupboard. The second purchaser was a young man and he too couldn't stand to keep the painting. He brought it back to the artist without even taking his money back. The man said he kept dreaming and complained that every night there was a shadow of the woman walking around and he was extremely afraid of it. The third buyer was a male and was completely skeptical of the cursed painting, but he too quickly returned it when he started to see the lady in the painting and her white eyes everywhere. He also claimed to have intense headaches while being in the room with it. It's believed that this painting is possessed by an evil spirit that has been haunting her targets and the creator since the completion of the painting. Apparently, the woman infiltrates targets' homes through a gallery transaction or art purchase. She takes her time to select her preferred target. She simply sits, displayed, and when an appropriate target comes along, they will be inexplicably drawn to the painting and compelled to purchase it. Once she is bought and brought into the home, the targets start to experience sleeplessness, nightmares, general misfortune, conflict with others living in the home, and the feeling of constantly being watched. It is unknown whether the painting is possessed or cursed, but due to so many people experiencing similar things while owning the painting, it's known around the world as one of the most haunted paintings in the world. The painting now hangs in the Venezia Salon, Merchik's furniture on the streets of Kyiv. Customers who visit the shop today claim that you can catch the painting smiling or having a glance of anger. In at number 3 we have Crying Boy. The Crying Boy was originally created by Italian painter Giovanni Bragolin in the 1950s and has been mass produced in alternative versions over the years, all portraits of tearful young boys or girls. In addition to being widely known, certain urban legends attribute a curse to the painting. One major reason for these claims come from a fire that happened in South Yorkshire, England in 1980. The owners of the home, Ron and May Hall, lost nearly everything to the blaze except one item, a painting of the crying boy. His wide eyes looking out from the wreckage are not even blackened by the smoke. In September of 1985, British tabloid The Sun published a story about the crying boy painting that caused fires and this story was backed up by a local fire station officer. The officer said these paintings turned up mysteriously unscathed in fires across the UK, all of which started spontaneously. After the story came out, many people got rid of the painting from their home, while others shrugged off the rumours and kept them hung in their homes. These paintings were readily available in stores during the 1950s to 1970s, so many people had one. They appealed to many young couples who wanted to decorate their homes with art. The paintings bear the prominent signature of one Giovanni Brogolin, but for quite some time no one could find information on this mysterious artist and why he paints sad children. One backstory from 2000 was about the boy in the famous crying boy painting, who was said to be a street urchin named Don Bonillo, who accidentally started a fire in which his parents died in Spain. From then on, whenever the boy went, a fire followed, giving him the nickname Diablo. Many people throughout England who had owned these paintings had unfortunate events happen to them, often involving fire. The son who did the original story of the cursed painting told the public to send them their paintings and they will set fire to them and get rid of the curse, and they did just that. They put out an article on Halloween in 1985 with the headline Crying Flame, claiming they dissolved the curse once and for all with a bonfire, burning stacks of these paintings which were all sent in by the public. The bonfire blazed near the River Thames, dissolving the curse into smoke. In at number 2 we have The Hands Resist Him. The Hands Resist Him was created by artist Bill Stoneham in 1972. It shows a young boy and a female doll standing in front of a glass panel door, against which many hands are pressed. According to Bill, the boy is based on a photograph of himself at the age of 5. The doorway is a representation of the dividing line between the current world and the world of fantasy and impossibilities, while the doll is a guide that will escort the boy through. 
through it. The hands represent alternative lives or possibilities. This painting became the subject of an urban legend and a viral internet meme in February 2000 when it was posted for sale on eBay, along with a description implying that it was haunted. The painting was first displayed at the Fine Garten Gallery in Beverly Hills, California, and was even reviewed by an art critic at the Los Angeles Times. According to Bill, the owner of the gallery and the art critic who reviewed the painting died within one year of coming into contact with it. During the show, the painting was purchased by actor John Marley, who had a notable role in the movie The Godfather. After Marley's death, the painting was found at the site of an old brewery by an elderly California couple who kept it until auctioning it on eBay in February 2000. According to the couple, the painting carried some form of a curse. They claimed that the characters in the painting moved during the night and that they would sometimes leave the painting and another room. And the painting had made its way to that room they had just entered. The couple also included a series of photographs they had taken, said to be evidence of an incident in which the female doll character threatened the male character with a gun that she was holding, causing him to attempt to leave the painting. A disclaimer was included in the listing absolving the seller from all liability if the painting was purchased. News of the listing ran rapid through the internet, catching lots of attention, and the auction page was viewed over 30,000 times. Some people who had seen the photo of the painting claimed that it made them feel ill or have an unpleasant experience. After an initial bid of $199, the painting eventually received 30 bids and sold for $1,025. The buyer of this cursed painting was the Perception Gallery in Grand Rapid, Michigan. An individual who saw the story of the Hands Resistant painting contacted Bill Stoneham in 2004 about commissioning a sequel. Bill agreed and actually went on to make three more paintings that related to the original, creating a series. On March 15, 2017, the Haunted Museum in Las Vegas announced it had acquired the prequel painting. Bill Stoneham finished the series with his final painting, What Remains, in 2021. And finally, in at number one, we have The Anguished Man. The Anguished Man is probably one of the most famous cursed paintings of all time. This oil painting is known to be the world's most haunted, not only paintings in the world, but objects next to the Annabelle doll and the Dybbuk box. This famous painting was created by an unknown artist who mixed the paint with his own blood. The artist was very troubled and soon after finishing the painting, he took his own life. The Anguished Man is currently owned by Sean Robinson from Cumbria, England. He inherited the painting from his grandmother who warned him that the painting was cursed. Despite what his grandmother said, the painting fascinated him. So he did take it, but he had to keep it in the basement of his house because his wife didn't like it. In 2010, Sean removed the painting from the basement after a flooding happened and put it in one of the bedrooms of the home. Shortly after moving the painting, Sean and his family started to experience strange happenings around the house, like seeing a shadowy figure of a man and hearing sounds of whispering and crying. The incidents kept happening, haunting each member of the family. At night time, Sean would suddenly awake to see a dark, faceless figure standing in his bedroom, and his wife discovered a stranger lying on the bed next to her, leaving her traumatized. The occurrence became dangerous when the couple's son, Keenan, felt a presence push him down the stairs. In 2011, Sean uploaded a video on YouTube titled Ghost Activity Caught on Tape, Haunted Painting, The Anguished Man, which had gained over 1 million views. The video was recorded for eight consecutive hours in the bedroom where the painting hung. The video contains footage of the door closing on its own, a loud bang, and sounds of scraping can be heard. Sean continued uploading videos, posting updates about the painting, and capturing further paranormal activity in the house, such as distorted sounds and a mysterious ghostly figure running past the camera. To this day, Sean still owns the cursed painting and refuses to destroy it. He keeps it in his basement to avoid any more harm to him and his family. He is currently planning on bringing his story and experiences to the big screen to make a film about the anguished man. Number five on this list is FDR's time capsule. Franklin D. Roosevelt was the 32nd President of the United States and served from 1933 until he died in 1945. He's one of the most well-known presidents in history and guided America through some very tough times. Getting the country through the Great Depression and also leading them into World War II was his most notable accomplishments. What many don't know is that before FDR died, he actually made a time capsule. It was buried in 1940, and other than a speech that FDR delivered, nobody has any idea what's in it. Maybe the scariest part about this is just how big this thing actually is. 450 pounds. That's how large this freaking time capsule is. That is a lot of weight, meaning that there's a ton of stuff in there. Ever since it went down, the mystery surrounding it has been massive. FDR being the literal president of the United States at the time of making it could have put any number of things in there. 
secret military documents, government weapons. I mean, it seems like a stretch to think that FDR put government weapons in here, but you also never know, like, what the hell else weighs 450 pounds? Maybe FDR is just trolling all of us and just put, like, 450 pounds worth of Coca-Cola in there or something like that. One theory that's been tossed out is some secrets involving aliens. I could honestly believe something like this. Maybe FDR thought that by 2040, when the time capsule is supposed to be opened, we would be ready as a society to learn such information. Hard to say for sure, but the fun thing about this one is that we'll actually get to see in just under 20 years. Hopefully it isn't cursed with a bunch of crazy government stuff though, and FDR can have one final last moment from the grave. Number 4 on this list is the world's largest axe. So this is a pretty big axe, guys. Located in New Brunswick, the massive axe is a symbol of the importance of the foresting industry to the small town it's located in, Nakawick. It was built in 1991 and it truly is one of a kind. Like what other place in the world would you just be in the middle of nowhere and see a massive axe just chilling there? I'll answer that for you. Nowhere, only Canada. The blade is 23 feet in length and made of 55 tons of solid steel. The handle of the steel then goes into the air 50 feet. So once again, it's a pretty big axe, guys. This axe doesn't just act as a symbolic structure though, but also as a time capsule. In the center of this axe, there's a time capsule that has yet to be opened. The thing is, nobody has any idea what's in this thing. Like most time capsules, you have some sort of clue, but with this one, it's literally anyone's guess. It's also in the middle of all this solid steel, making it pretty freaking difficult to get to even if you wanted to open it. People have speculated that something creepy may be in there, and that's why no one has gone to claim it yet. It's currently believed that it may never be opened, and that could be the case. This is one of those things that not a ton of people know about, and if time continues to pass, people could very easily forget that there's a creepy time capsule in this massive axe on the side of the road to begin with. Comment down below what you think is in this huge axe and why it's this big secret. What could they be hiding in that thing that they don't want anyone to know about? Number three on this list is ancient Egyptian tombs. A time capsule, as defined by Google, is a historic cache of goods or information usually intended as a deliberate method of communication with future people and to help future archaeologists, anthropologists, or historians. Now a tomb, as defined by Google, is a repository for the remains of the dead. It is generally any structurally enclosed internment space or burial chamber of varying size. Placing a corpse into a tomb can be called immurement and is a method of final disposition as an alternative to cremation or burial. So when you put it that way, they really aren't that different. These ancient Egyptian tombs have a bunch of stuff inside of them from the time period that whatever pharaoh or person who's buried lived. These tombs can be really cool and there's tons to learn from going inside of them. Problem is, they're pretty cursed. The tomb of Anctifi reads on the outside of the tomb, any ruler who shall do evil or wickedness to this coffin, may Heman, who's a local deity, not accept any goods he offers and may his heir not inherit. The tomb of Kentiko reads on the outside, As for all men who shall enter this my tomb, in pure there will be judgment, an end shall be made for him, I shall seize his neck like a bird, I shall cast the fear of myself into him. Those are just two tombs in Egypt that have some pretty horrible curses waiting for those who enter. Not to mention the most famous Egyptian tomb of all, King Tut. As we talked about on this channel before, pretty much everybody who was involved with the initial expedition into King Tut's tomb suffered a very grim fate pretty shortly after. There's much to learn about ancient Egyptian history in these tombs or time capsules, but it may just be not worth the risk considering what we've seen from them in the past. Number two on this list is the Crypt of Civilization. This time capsule is pretty much exactly how it sounds. It truly is a crypt of civilization, and honestly, that just makes it a little bit more creepy. Newsweek writes, Buried in 1940 at Oglethorpe University in Atlanta by the university's former president, Thornwell Jacobs, it is modeled after a cell that one might find in an Egyptian pyramid. 
The enormous vault contains items that have been crucial to our civilization thus far. Classic works of film and literature, every book of faith, an original script for Gone with the Wind, as well as cultural odds and ends, including a sealed bottle of Budweiser and a typewriter. But what if future civilizations can't read English? Not to worry, at the front of the crypt lies a language integrator, a machine intended to help the aliens who open said crypt with our mother tongue. So this capsule, although it's definitely one of the coolest capsules probably in the world, never should be opened. If it's open, then there's a high likelihood that it wasn't by humans who did it, and therefore it's opening probably means something bad happened to our human race. Like they literally planned for this thing to get opened in 6,000 years and are fully planning for humans to not be around anymore. Or at the very least, not speaking the language that we currently speak. It's kind of scary to me that we're thinking that in a few thousand years, civilization as we know it may cease to exist. We're also already planning ahead for aliens, which begs the question, did the people who built this capsule know something that we don't? Is it possible that they've already been in contact with such beings and that's why they know to leave such a device here in the first place? Let me know in the comments. And finally, number one on this list is the Richard Nixon time capsule. What is it with these presidents and time capsules? We already looked at FDR and his 450 pound one, but now we need to take a look at Nixon and this one's even more controversial. The following is from an article written by David Emery. Richard Nixon, who according to the book's author, Larry Holcomb, was convinced that a limited level of UFO disclosure would ensure his place in history, went to extraordinary lengths to preserve that information for posterity if more recent reports are to be believed. A March 20th, 2018 article on the conspiracy-oriented blog, yournewswire.com, featured quotes from a phone interview with Robert Merritt, a sometime police informant and, according to him, covert domestic intelligence operative for the Nixon administration, in which he says he was shown proof of extraterrestrial life during a face-to-face -face meeting with the president. In what appears to be a startling new twist, Merritt reveals to List that he met three times with President Nixon in a deep underground location beneath the White House. In the first, Nixon read him a letter stating that U.S. was protecting an extraterrestrial being and that scientists at Los Alamos were able to communicate with it and obtain advanced technology in science. Nixon then sealed the letter in a time capsule that he hid somewhere in the White House. Aliens, an underground bunker beneath the White House, and the former president being in on all of it? This story has everything. All of this has apparently went down at the White House too, and this secret time capsule is still hidden there. This honestly sounds like the plot of a National Treasure movie or something like that. If this is true, and if Nixon really did hide away this information for future generations to find, then think about the ramifications that could have. Yes, we may learn something incredible about aliens, but how much did he tell us? Is this going to be one of those scenarios where when we hear it, we immediately wish that we hadn't? This time capsule is cursed because if it's found and revealed to the public, nobody has any idea how much damage it could cause. This could start full on worldwide riots with governments being overthrown by the public. Mass chaos and panic could ensue and wars could break out depending on what Nixon actually revealed. Comment down below if you think this story is true or not and if it is, what did the former president leave behind? Number 5 on this list is the British Museum. The British Museum has a super haunted item in it that is said to be somewhat responsible for the death of hundreds of individuals. The Unlucky Mummy. Museum Crush says, not actually a mummy, but the mummy board or coffin lid of an unknown high status woman from the 21st or 22nd dynasty. The British Museum's Unlucky Mummy has earned quite the reputation for causing destruction through its ancient curse. The mysterious mummy was found at Thebes in the late 1800s and tales of its curse start soon after that. It's said that of the four young Englishmen who bought it, two died in shooting incidents and two died in poverty. A string of illnesses, accidents and deaths following this are said to be attributed to the mummy. One of the most astonishing rumors surrounding the mummy's curse is that it caused the sinking of the Titanic with the loss of more than 1,500 
lives. One of the victims on the Titanic was journalist William Thomas Steed, who was one of the first to pen articles about the mummy's curse. Survivors from the disaster recall Steed telling stories of the ominous artifact over dinner, and as the mummy's sinister reputation grew, people even began to believe that its presence on board caused the disaster. Now I will say this, there was no actual record of the mummy being on the Titanic. I mean, think about it. If it was, then how could it be in the museum right now? It would be at the bottom of the ocean. So we know that it was never actually there, but that didn't stop it from cursing the boat all the same. It's believed that Steed carried this curse onto the ship, and that the telling of these stories are what ultimately cursed the ship to begin with. Almost as if bringing up the mummy multiple times in a row unleashed its power. For my sake, I really hope that this isn't the case though. Pretty sure I've talked about this mummy a few times before on this channel, and if this is like a Beetlejuice thing, like say it so many times and then it happens, then I could be in for some trouble. Number four on this list is the Royal Museum's Greenwich. So apparently the Queen's house in the museum actually has a cursed piece of architecture built into it. Museum Crush says, rather a large object, the tulip staircase of the Queen's House of Royal Museum's Greenwich lays claim to being the first geometric self-supporting spiral stair in Britain and is rightly regarded as one of the great features of the former royal residence. But it is also the location of the Rev R. W. Hardy's famous ghost photograph. The retired Canadian vicar and his wife visited the house in 1966 and like many people before and since happily snapped away at the elegant spiral of stairs. But it wasn't until they returned to British Columbia and developed their films that they noticed a scarily cloaked spectral figure climbing the stairs. Subsequent investigations into both stairs and photograph have thrown no further light on the unearthly mystery, although as recently as 2002 a member of staff reported seeing a ghostly figure cross a balcony of the stairway before disappearing in time-honored ghostly fashion through a wall. I guess you could argue the staircase isn't necessarily an item, but who cares? The museum is still as haunted as ever, and maybe even more so. At least with other museums that have haunted or cursed items, the curse just pertains to that object. And usually if you don't touch the object or interact with it, you should be fine. Just walking around this place, and especially going up or down the stairs, carries a pretty heavy risk to it. Be very careful around the stairs at the Queen's house if you ever end up going. Number three on this list is the Thirsk Museum. Located in Yorkshire Museum, this tiny little quaint museum is the last place you would expect to see something haunted. Enter in the Busby Stoop Chair. Museum Crush says, Yorkshire drunk, criminal, and coin counterfeiter Thomas Busby murdered his father-in-law and fellow counterfeiter Daniel Autie in 1702. Busby was arrested at the local inn and sentenced to death by hanging. According to legend, he laid a curse on his favorite chair at the inn, saying death would come soon to anyone who dared sit in his seat. After his execution, his remains were hung in a gibbet from a stoop at Sand Hutton Crossroads, now the location of the Busby Stoop Inn. The inn and surrounding area were said to be haunted by Busby's ghost, but one chair there in particular had developed a rather sinister reputation following a string of tragic accidents. Second World War airmen who sat in the chair were said to never return from their missions, and the chair also linked to several road accidents and fatal illnesses. In 1978, the inn's landlord removed the chair to Thirsk Museum just a few miles down the road. The chair is now suspended high above the ground of the museum to ensure that no unassuming soul can ever fall foul of its curse again. It's been hung there, unmoved, for 40 years. I've looked into this chair further, and for a while there, it really was that if you sat in this thing, you were going to die. It wasn't going to happen in a year from now or something like that either. Like, we're talking about pretty imminent death here. Number two on this list is the Natural History Museum. The Natural History Museum is one of the most complete museums in the world, and being so complete, it obviously has to include a cursed item. Museum Crush says, this apparently cursed gem was owned by 19th century polymath Edward Heron Allen. So powerful was its curse that he eventually decided to have it stored away in a bank vault inside seven locked boxes with a note 
of warning to anyone who dare handle it. Heron Allen also left strict instruction not to remove the amethyst until 33 years after his death. The curious story surrounding the stone says that it was stolen from the temple of the god Indra during the Indian mutiny by Colonel W. Ferris, an officer of the Bengal cavalry. After Ferris's health deteriorated and he died, the cursed amethyst was passed on to his son, who suffered a similar bout of bad luck and eventually gave it to Heron Allen. After facing a string of health and financial misfortunes, Heron Allen made several attempts to get rid of the stone, but they all proved unsuccessful each time it returned to him. Less than a year after his death, Heron Allen's daughter donated the amethyst to the Natural History Museum, where it is on display in the vault. And finally, number one on this list is Zach Baggins Haunted Museum. The number one voted haunted place in America has got to make this list, considering it's full of cursed objects. There isn't just one object here that's cursed, there are tons. In fact, we would need our own separate video dedicated solely to this place to even begin to break down all the scary stuff that's in this museum. Just listen to this small excerpt from the website. Among the hundreds of terrifying possessions, museum goers can even peek inside the VW death van in which Dr. Jack Kevorkian ended the suffering of terminally ill patients, as well as get a close-up look at the propofol chair from Michael Jack death room. Perhaps most unsettling is the original staircase from the Indiana Demon House, notorious for its powerful paranormal activity before being demolished in 2014. The wooden banister and creaky steps from the house now stand in a dimly lit corner, resting on a blanket of dirt from the location. Following its installation, a group of construction workers walked off the job and refused to come back. These are just a couple of the so-called attractions that this place has to offer. If you go to this museum, then there is a very good chance you will end up walking out with a curse attached to you. That much paranormal energy all lumped into one place, it just spells out something haunted. Be very careful if you ever intend to go here. on this list is Shams al-Marif. This book, from my findings, is not inherently evil in its teachings, but is one of those examples of potentially being a bit too much power for one person to possess. It's a 13th century Arabic grimoire written by Ahmed al buni The book attempts to teach its readers how to perform ancient Arabic magic and is very spiritualistic. This book was super influential in Arabic culture and gained a large following. Many good things have come from this book, but also when you have a large amount of people following anything, some take it too far. Wikipedia writes, in contemporary form, the book consists of two volumes, Shams al-Marif al-Kubra and Shams al-Marif al-Sugra, the former being the larger of the two. The first few chapters introduce the reader to magic squares and the combination of numbers and the alphabet that are believed to bring magical effect, which the author insists is the only way to communicate with jinn, angels, and spirits. And that right there is one of the main teachings in this book, the ability to talk to spirits. The amount of scary stories that we've talked about on this channel though, in regards to people trying to communicate with the dead is crazy, and it shows just how often things like this can go wrong. This has obviously happened many a time with this book, and those trying to reach their departed loved one end up contacting a super dangerous demon. I don't think that there's anything morally wrong with contacting the dead, if the dead are okay with it of course, but it seems like doing this always ends up with something bad happening. This grimoire won't curse you just by simply reading it, but if you try and perform some of the rituals it suggests, then it's very likely that you could cause some serious harm to you or those that you love. I recommend just avoiding this book altogether. Number four on this list is De Vermi Mystery. Now the book in question here is actually a fictional book, and therefore it would be actually impossible for you to read it anyways, even if you wanted to for some reason. But that being said, it doesn't change the fact that it's definitely cursed and extremely evil. If this book was real, then we would need to get rid of it as soon as possible because it teaches humans how to do some very dangerous things. The book is part of the Lovecraftian universe and made its first appearance in The Secret 
secret of the tomb. The book isn't referenced too much in that story, but it's described in pretty good detail in the story The Black Bargain. In that book, it describes Devami Masai as something that told you how you could compound asinite and belladonna and draw circles of phosphorescent fire on the floor when the stars were right. Something that spoke of melting tallow candles and blending them with corpse fat, whispered of the uses to which animal sacrifices might be put. It spoke of meetings that could be arranged with various parties most people don't even believe in, with cold, deliberate directions for traffic with ancient evil. Drawing circles of fire, sacrificing animals, talking with ancient evil, this all sounds like pretty bad news to me. Especially the part that says you can arrange meetings with various parties. It's clear that not only can this book teach someone how to perform any number of spells and incantations, but some of those spells will deal with the summoning of ancient demons and creatures. And if we assume that this book is real and can be read, then that would also mean that the terrifyingly powerful gods Lovecraft wrote about would also be real. Meaning that this book could grant you the ability to summon Cthulhu or something even worse. Summoning your standard demon is already bad enough, but an all-knowing, super powerful god definitely raises the stakes a little bit. This book, from every description I can read about, sounds like something that's just far too dangerous for any human to use and wield safely. If it ever was real and you did happen to stumble upon it, best to avoid reading it at all costs. Number three on this list is the Book of Abramelin. Abraham was an Egyptian mage who lived between 1362 and 1458 and dedicated his life to magic. Once Abraham visited Egypt and there he met a magician, not that magician which you see on TV shows, but that who really knows dark magic and dark secrets. He told Abraham many dark and mysterious secrets and strange things which you and I can never imagine. He told him how to live the dead person, the location of under earth treasures, how to to contact devils. Besides this, he also told him the secrets of becoming invisible and flying in the sky. That last passage that I just read was written by Sharik Kamal while he was listing the most cursed books of all time. This book is known to be dangerous and it isn't just because of the contents in it either. Yes, summoning the dead and performing dark magic in its own right is very dangerous and has the potential to cause serious problems for you and those around you. This book though may just be inherently cursed to begin with. Many people who have read this book, even those who don't go on to perform any of the rituals or incantations that the book describes, have gotten horribly bad luck afterwards. Like the second they opened up the book and started reading, their entire life just flipped on its side. Some have said that afterwards their home became haunted by some dark spirit and they had to move. It's almost as if the book itself is a portal to another demonic dimension and just the action of opening it could cause something to leak out. I'm sure that Abraham was a great writer, but no book is worth dying over, so I won't be reading this one anytime soon. Number two on this list is The Great Omar. This book is believed to be the cause of one of the most tragic disasters in all of human history. Sinking the unsinkable ship, the Titanic. No, you don't catch Leonardo DiCaprio reading this book in the 1997 movie version, but maybe he should have. This book, even though it is deeply cursed, is potentially the most ornate and beautiful books to have ever been created. In fact, it took over 2,500 hours to create this book, which translates to over 100 full days. One would think that a book of this kind would fetch quite the pretty penny, but that actually wasn't the case. In fact, the man who binded this book, Francis Sangorski, had an extremely hard time trying to sell it to anyone. Finally, he did find a home for it in America and was in the process of sending it over there. But it never reached its destination though because it was on the Titanic. Now the reason that people think this book had something to do with the unsinkable ship sinking is because only a week or so after the ship had gone down, so did Sangorski. He died by drowning to death a very short time after the book had also sunk to the bottom of the ocean. This is why people believe that something about this book will curse those around it and potentially lead to someone drowning. I personally think it's a bit of a stretch to just assume that having this book caused the entire Titanic to sink. However, it is a remarkable coincidence what happened to Sangorski. It probably won't ever happen, but if this book ever did wash ashore one day, 
I wouldn't want to be the one to pick it up first. Number one on this list is the Book of Soiga. The Book of Soiga is one of the most complete collections of magic and dark magic that one could come across. Wikipedia writes, amongst the incantations and instructions on magic, astrology, demonology, lists of conjunctions, lunar mansions, and names of genealogies of angels, the book contains 36 large squares of letters which D was unable to decipher. Otherwise unknown medieval magical treaties are cited including works known as the Liber E, Liber O's, Liber Dignus, Liber Sipple, and Liber Muno. So we'll get to those letters in a second because those play into the cursed nature of this book, but even without those, we're still dealing with a book that goes into depth on some pretty dangerous topics. The one that jumps off the page to me as being potentially problematic is demonology. The study of demons and the hierarchy to them and also the study of how to potentially summon them. This is certainly problematic and already a reason to not read this book, but let's get back to those letters. In 1608, there lived a man named John D. John D. was fascinated with this book and wanted to figure out how to decode the letters. He reached out to the angel Uriel, and Uriel told him that only the worthy one will be able to crack the code. Truly a chosen one scenario where the book will reveal its secrets to the one that it decides. John D. tried to decode it anyways, but then a grim fate befell him and he died. Then, very mysteriously, the book disappeared from the face of the earth for almost 400 years, until it all of a sudden reappeared in 1994. Now, it's thought that trying to decode these letters could prove fatal if you aren't the one worthy to do so. There's over 7 billion people on the planet, so the odds that you're the one worthy one and won't die are pretty slim. Not the sort of odds that I'd want to take just to look at some strange medieval letters. Alrighty, what are we starting off with today? Oh, none other than the infamous Robert doll. Okay, maybe he isn't ancient compared to a lot of the other artifacts I'll be talking about today, but he makes up for it in the terrifying category. For starters, the doll only looks vaguely human. His nub of a nose looks like a pair of pinholes, and he's covered in like little brown marks, kind of like scars. His eyes are beady and black, and combined with his malevolent smirk, he's terrifying to look at. And that's coming from somebody who loves creepy dolls. Clasped in his lap, he's holding his own toy, a dog with disproportionately positioned eyes, and a two-baked tongue falling out of its mouth. Now, this doll originally belonged to Robert Eugene Otto, an artist described as eccentric, which, you know, most artists are, but I promise. I'll elaborate. Neighbors of Robert used to hear him having a conversation with the doll, and this continued into his adult years. Okay, that's not too weird. He brought it everywhere and talked about it in the first person as if it weren't a doll. That might sound kind of batty, but yeah, it's the best way to deal with cursed objects. Trust me, I'm talking from experience. The doll remained stored in the Otto family home until Robert died in 1974. Now, after his death, a couple bought the house, and their young daughter found the doll in the attic. The girl often claimed that the doll was enough trying to enter. Go figure. It was hidden away, probably for a reason. The doll is now on display in a museum in Key West and is still believed to curse people. His last caretaker before the museum experienced him disappear and reappear as he pleased, along with hearing footsteps and giggling in the attic. Some claimed the doll's expression changed when anybody badmouthed uh, his owner in his presence. He's also been responsible for, oh, let's see, a couple of car crashes, some divorces, broken bones. Okay, good Robert, please. I don't need to be cursed. Let's move on, shall we? Next up, we have the Dybbuk Box, or Dybbuk Box. Depending on who you ask, the pronunciations are different all over the interwebs. Nevertheless, in Jewish folklore, this is an evil spirit. Supposedly, a Holocaust survivor accidentally summoned the demon while using a homemade Ouija board that managed to trap it inside the wine cabinet. Okie dokie, let's just unpack that for a second. Somebody summoned something evil with a Ouija board, sealed it in something else, and people keep trying to awaken it. Let sleeping demons live or crying out loud. It's a new year. Let's just like not bring anything crazy into it. Kevin Manis bought the box at an estate sale in 2001 and immediately started having nightmares about an evil hag. You know, ditto for anybody who stayed with him. Now he gave the box to his mother, who suffered a stroke on the same day. By the way, this story was the inspiration for the 2012 horror film, The Possession. You've probably heard about it. The box's later owners have also claimed that, uh, yeah, that creature appeared in their nightmares as well. The last owner was Jason Haxton, director of the Museum of Osteopathic Medicine, who not only had nightmares, but developed a strange skin disease and began coughing up red fluids, if you get what I mean. Now at that point, he contacted his local rabbis, sealed the creature back in the box, and gave the cabinet to uh, Zach Baggins. You've probably heard of him, Ghost Adventures. Yeah, that went in his museum. By the way, uh, most recently in 2018, Post Malone fans claimed his series of bad luck was caused by his contact with the cabinet. Look, don't look at me, I believe in omens. Let those things be, let them be. 
Alrighty, so that brings us to the midway point on today's list, James Dean's car. You know James Dean, right? I hope so. This man freaking loved his 1955 Porsche Spider, having had it extensively customized, and he eventually called it, yeah you've guessed it, a little Now apparently the car was so transparently evil that Sir Alec Guinness, when meeting Dean for lunch, claimed, if you get in that, you're gonna be found dead in it by this time next week. Now James Dean laughed it off, he was like, eh, whatever. He went off to go prepare his car for the Selena sports car races, with his Porsche mechanic, Rolf Weatherich. Enlisting stuntman Bill Hickman to help out, their little plan was to tow, let's call it Little B, to the races, but Rolf felt it would be better to Dean to get used to the vehicle and run the engine in. I'm not the expert here. On that fateful Friday, Rolf sat next to Dean while Hickman followed with his truck and trailer. Police pulled over the convoy and issued a pair of speeding tickets just outside Bakersfield, but that didn't slow anybody down. Please, this car was meant to go fast. All right, so we're barreling down Route 466 at an estimated 85 miles per hour when a young student named Donald Turnipseed, you know, driving a Ford two-door, decided to make a sudden turn onto Route 41. Now, the impact sent the Ford almost 40 feet down the road and ejected Rolf from the Porsche. James Dean was pronounced dead on arrival at the Paso Robles War Memorial Hospital at 6.20 p.m. But of course, it wouldn't be a curse if it stopped there. When the mechanics tried to repair the wrecked car, it fell on one of them crushing both his legs. Dr. William S. Ridge bought the Porsche from a salvage yard in Burbank and proceeded to strip it for parts. He installed the engine into his Lotus race car, then loaned the transmission and suspension parts to fellow doctor and racer Troy McHenry. Now our good doctor crashed the Lotus at the 1956 Pomona sports car races, surviving, but McHenry, not so lucky. He hit a tree in the same race. That was the end of him, and that's where the curse gains its strength. Two thieves who tried to take pieces of the car were both injured. Yep, the curse doesn't stop here. Shortly after those crashes, a publicity monger and self-proclaimed King of Customs, George Barris bought the spider, promising to rebuild it. When the mangled frame was found to be beyond recovery, he chose to capitalize on the car's notoriety. The Porsche was loaned to the Los Angeles chapter of the National Safety Council, and from 1957 to 59, it went on a gruesome tour of car shows, movie theaters, and bowling alleys. In March of 1959, while in storage in Fresno, the car caught fire. No idea. Just poof. It suffered remarkably little damage, just two melted tires, some singed paint, and fortunately the fire didn't spread to the other vehicles in storage. Now meanwhile, Barris, yeah we all remember him, had sold a pair of tires from the 550 and both reportedly blew at the same time, causing the new owner to, yeah, skid off the road. Little B even managed to crush and kill a truck driver who was transporting it. The car has since disappeared into a museum archive, which is probably for the best. I'm nervous enough around regular cars, but the thought of this cursed monstrosity is making me extra jittery. Or that's maybe from the monster I had earlier. But still, as somebody who drives on the 401 on a regular basis, no thank you. Next up folks, we've got the unlucky mummy. Great, I don't think I've ever met a lucky mummy, but make of that what you will. So even though technically speaking, an iceberg and poor building plans caused the end of the Titanic, what if there were supernatural forces at play that pushed the fate of the ship along? Enter, you guessed it, the unlucky mummy. It was donated to the British Museum in July of 1889 by Mrs. Warwick Hunt of Holland Park, London, on behalf of Mr. Arthur F. Wheeler. It was displayed in the first Egyptian room of the museum from the 1890s and has remained on public view ever since, with the exception of periods during the First and Second World Wars, you know, when it was removed from its case for safety. It has left the museum on a number of occasions, when it formed part of a temporary exhibition held at two venues in Australia, and between February 4th to May 27th of 2007, along with a bunch of other pieces, the unlucky mummy was exhibited at Taiwan's National Palace Museum during a press conference. The mummy to which the article belonged is said to have been left in Egypt since it never formed part of the collections of the British Museum. The mummy board is currently displayed in room 62. The name unlucky mummy is misleading as the artifact isn't really a mummy at all. I promise I'm getting to it, but it's a painted wooden mummy board. So it's kind of like the inner coffin lid. It was found at Thebes and can be dated by its shape and the style of its decoration to the late 21st or early 22nd dynasty. In the British Museum, it is known by its serial number EA22542. The beardless face and the position of the hands with the fingers extended show that it was made to cover the mummified body of a woman. Her identity isn't known due to the brief hieroglyphic inscriptions containing only short religious phrases and omitting mention of the name of the deceased. The high quality of the lid indicates that the owner was a person of high rank. It was unusual for such ladies to participate in the musical accompaniments to the rituals in the temple of Amun-Ra. Hence, early British museum publications describe the owner of 22542 as a priestess of Amun-Ra. E. Wallace Budge, keeper of Egyptian and Assyrian antiquities from 1894 to 1924, also suggested that she might have been of royal descent. But we're not quite sure. I, I'm, not, I'm not a history expert, folks. 
for a lot of reasons. And finally, we have the one chair you might not want to sit in. Or don't take my advice and see for yourself. Popularly known as Busby's stoop chair, this wooden furniture is cursed by the spirit of Thomas Busby, who was known to ruthlessly um, kill people. Thomas was arrested, tried, and condemned to death after he killed his father-in-law, Daniel Audie, in 1702. Audie and Busby were running a coin counterfeiting business, as well as other criminal enterprises, and they argued about the business, which ended with me ending you, you know. Before getting hanged for his crimes, he requested to have a meal in his favorite local pub. And upon finishing his meal, he stood and said, May sudden death come to anyone who dares sit on my chair. And ever since then, 63 people who dared to sit on the chair met untimely and terrifying deaths. I'm sorry. Someone out there waited until the death toll got to 63 before deciding, hmm, maybe there's something wrong. I feel like I would have noticed the common link in deaths by, I don't know, 20 weird deaths or so? At least? Specifically, locals claim that during the Second World War, Canadian airmen from the nearby base at Skipton on Swale went to the pub, and those who sat in the chair never returned from missions over mainland Europe. As recent as the 1970s, some fatal accidents were linked with the chair. Busby was, uh, you know, ended at Sand Hutton Crossroads, beside an inn, which later had its name changed to the Busby Stoop Inn. The site of the execution, opposite the pub on the A61 and A167 crossroads, which are apparently now a roundabout, was said to be haunted by his ghost. Later, the owner of the pub donated the chair to the Thirsk Museum in the United Kingdom, and it's still there, but it's hung up above the ground to prevent any further deaths. Granted, it's only about like 1.5 meters above the ground, which I don't think that's high enough. Stupid people will still find a way. May I recommend a healthy three feet, or put it in a box, or even better, put it away forever. Coming at number five, we've got the Golden Eagle. With a name like that, you'd assume it's just some dad's wicked old muscle car. Not quite though. It's a 1964 Dodge 330 and it's gone through the hands of many people. The transfer from owner to owner is rarely peaceful though. This car is known for its tendency to kill people. And we're not just talking about unfortunate accidents and collisions, it caused death to all those who owned it, usually in very odd and violent ways. Originally, it was a police cruiser. Patrolmen and the like would bring it out for their daily activities. The first person assigned to the car was killed relatively quickly. Then two more officers got a chance at driving it and they were killed as well. The weird thing is, all the deaths were gruesome murder suicides. Not a great start for this vehicle, eh? Well, after seeing it happen thrice, the folks at the police station had seen enough. They took the car off the force and sold it off to a young family. Interestingly, the family didn't seem to have any issues with this cursed car, but that didn't stop it from killing. No, no. It refrained from ending the lives of its drivers at the time, but when neighbors learned about its history, they took up arms. During the night, many would attempt to vandalize the car, but it would not be stopped. Many who attempted to damage the vehicle ended up perishing in unexplained ways. There was nothing to directly connect these things to the car, but those who did mess with it often got messed up. Eventually, it was decided that enough was enough, and the car was brought to the impound lot. This led to it being chopped up into pieces, and somehow, this still wasn't the end. The car still rides, in some capacity. A lot of the parts stripped from the impounded Gold Eagle were used to build another car. At this point, we're entering Ship of Theseus territory, and we have to decide whether or not that means that the Gold Eagle still is rolling around, or if it's a whole new thing. After a supposed 14 deaths, it's probably for the best that the original car is retired. Nobody's reported any new incidents related to it, but who knows? All in due time. Coming in at number four, we've got James Dean's Porsche 550 Spider. A classic tale like no other, many think that Dean's unfortunate passing was a result of reckless driving. And if the story had stopped there, that's probably what it would have been chalked up to. However, the two seater that would become famously known as Little Bastard made sure to cause plenty of trouble in the years following the original accident. Our story starts with James Dean, legendary actor and racing enthusiast. Considering a career in motorsport to go along with his acting, he entered many races and did quite well. After being barred from racing during the filming of one of his movies, he wanted to get back out there as soon as possible. Trading in his speedster for the now infamous 1955 Porsche 550 Spider, he was ready to roll. Wanting to break the car in before racing it, he decided to drive it all the way from LA to Salinas. During this trip, he crashed into a turning vehicle, flipping the spider and sending his passenger flying. Dean remained inside the car, tumbling about, and was killed almost instantly. The car was totaled, but there were bits that could be saved. 
The engine and drivetrain were salvaged and sold to a duo of doctors who were into similar races. After integrating these parts into their own cars, the doctors entered a race and both crashed. One of the two actually died as a result of their accident. At this point, the car was going to be made an example of. While in storage, waiting to be used as warning for student drivers, the garage it was kept in burned down. Then, in a comedy of errors, the car was brought to multiple different schools and caused problems at each one. First it fell off the truck that was carrying it, then it tipped over and broke a student's hip, and finally some thieves tried to steal the bloodstained seats and steering wheel only to sustain injuries in the attempt. Then, and this is the really crazy bit, the car straight up disappeared, just pfft, like that. Couldn't even drive it if you wanted to. But I'll bet if it ever does show up again, the next person to try and drive it will end up much worse off than they'd be if they didn't. Coming in at number three, we've got a ghost crash. While the car itself might not be cursed, there's definitely some haunting going on here. Back in the early 2000s, police discovered a car that had crashed about five months earlier. Inside were the remains of a decomposing body killed by the car veering off the road and crashing into the woods. That doesn't sound too odd, right? A crash happened, nobody was around to see it, and the cops found the results months down the line. But here's the weird part. People kept calling in and reporting headlights swerving off the road right at that very location. Every time the cops went out to see though, they found no evidence of an accident. Eventually, after plenty of what they assumed were prank calls, they did an in-depth search of the area, finally coming across the wreckage. Some say that the spirit of the man inside the car was trying to lead people to his location so he could be discovered and put to rest. The car in question was a Vohal Astra, so if you're ever in or around one, just Keep an eye out for spirits. Coming in number two, we've got John F. Kennedy's limo. Any car involved with a death will generate some rumors about curses. However, I'm gonna go out on a limb here and guess that the number of deaths in cars caused by accidents and collisions outnumber those caused by assassination. Just maybe, right? This Lincoln 74A convertible was meant to be the ultimate in presidential locomotion. For whatever reason though, it was never made bulletproof. Plenty of other upgrades were added to it, but never one meant to stop bullets. Huh. Well, we all know how that played out in the end. After Kennedy's death, the limo was still used as a presidential vehicle for almost a decade, albeit with some major changes in look and feel. It was phased out over time and ended up in a museum, but to this day, people claim to see shadowy figures hanging out near it. The most common claim is that a figure dressed in gray can be seen standing next to the car. Usually this apparition appears in November, but it has been spotted during other months. And finally at number one, Archduke Franz Ferdinand's Graf and Stift Double Phaeton. That is a mouthful, and a wildly important vehicle when you consider the course of world history. Many blame this car for the beginning of World War I, although that might be a bit of a stretch. See, Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife had narrowly avoided being a by Bosnian hitmen. Being the classy states people they were, they decided to go to the hospital and visit those who had been injured in the attempt on their lives. Their car stalled out in front of a cafe where one of the assassins had stopped to get a drink. Seeing the Archduke in a motionless car, right there, he took the opportunity and gunned him down. This was the tipping point that pushed nations into the First World War. So if you firmly believe in like concrete cause and effect, you can probably blame all the deaths in that war on this one vehicle. Gnarly. From there, it would change hands about 14 more times, claiming over a dozen lives in assorted accidents and mechanical failures. So even when it works, and even when it's not in the hands of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, this car is cursed. Number five on this list is King Tut's Mask. The curse of King Tut is one of the most famous curses to surround a tomb ever. King Tut was a pharaoh in ancient Egypt who boasted one of the most ornate tombs in history. This tomb carried a curse though, and those who entered it suffered fatal consequences. On the pyramids of Giza, there's a very specific curse written on the entrance. It reads, all people who enter this tomb who will make evil against this tomb and destroy it may the crocodile be against them in the water and snakes against them on land. May the hippopotamus be against them in the water, the scorpion on land. This curse stuck with those who entered. It all started with Howard Carter, the leader of the team, whose canary was eaten by a cobra the second that they first entered the tomb. Then the person who financed the whole excavation died shortly afterwards. And from there, a domino effect occurred where many others involved suffered horrible tragedies or passed away. Some speculate though that it wasn't actually the act of opening the tomb that sparked this curse, but it was what they did with King Tut's mask. King Tut had a burial mask on when he was mummified and put in his tomb. 
The mask is beautiful. It's meant to resemble the person it's on so that the gods can recognize him and bring him up to heaven. Inside the mask is a bunch of oils and materials that are said to help preserve the body. All of this is all well and good, but on the back of the mask is an inscription. This inscription is said to be a curse similar to the one on the pyramids of Giza. Well, if that wasn't enough, then there's a rumor this mask was broken during the excavation process and had to be reassembled when they took it back to their headquarters. Opening the tomb is already problematic, but to then break the mask of King Tut that has a curse inscribed on it, that's just asking for trouble. Number four on this list is King Casimir IV's coffin. King Casimir was born in 1427 into royalty. By 1440, when he would have only been 13, Casimir was named the Grand Duke of Lithuania and only seven years later in 1447 became the fully fledged King of Poland. He stood as the King of Poland right up until the day he died. Oftentimes, kings don't make it right up until their death, but King Casimir's success was pretty historic. He's known in Polish history as being one of the most politically active and prosperous kings to ever rule over their country. During his reign, he won several wars, recovered territories for Poland, and made their royal family one of the leaders in Europe. Due to all of the glory that he received in his life, it was only fitting that he have a tomb that reflected this. He died when he was 65 years old in 1492 and was put to rest in the chapel of Weywell Castle. There he lay for roughly 500 years until 1973 researchers opened the tomb to find a horrible surprise. The researchers opened this tomb and investigated the mummification process and all the artifacts he was buried with. They took his body and coffin out of this place and brought it back to their lab. What they didn't realize though was that this coffin had a curse to it. It's estimated that over 15 people died who worked on researching this body and this coffin. It took a while before they realized what was causing this death, but eventually they discovered the error of their ways. You see, the coffin was cursed, but it wasn't cursed with anything ghostly. It was cursed with Aspergillus flavus. Cursed is also a misleading word to use in this instance as well, because Aspergillus flavus is actually a pathogenic fungus. A fungus that when exposed to people, can become a killer. For a long time, people thought that there truly was an ancient curse surrounding this coffin, but it was actually this fungus that kept preying on people's immune systems. Eventually, King Casimir's body was taken and put back into his tomb, but not before the damage had been done and over 15 people had lost their lives. Number three on this list is the screaming skull of Burton Agnes Hall. The screaming skull of Burton Agnes Hall wasn't necessarily from a tomb, but it was recovered from a grave, so I think it still counts in this criteria. Burton Agnes Hall was built in the 17th century in Yorkshire. It was built by Sir Henry Griffith, who had three daughters he loved very much. They all moved there and were very happy for a time. One of the daughters was named Anne, and Anne loved to explore the outdoors. One day though, when she was exploring, a gang of robbers got to her and they beat her and left her for dead. When the family found her, there was barely any life left in her. They brought her back to their home, but her time on this world wasn't long. While she was dying, she had a very strange request to her two remaining sisters. She begged them to take her head and put it within the walls of the hall so that she could always be there with her family. She was dying, so they agreed, but neither of them actually intended on taking their sister's head off and keeping it in their home. A few days later, she died, and they buried her outside the hall without keeping their promise. This was a big mistake though. After she was buried, strange noises and banging sounds started happening all over the hall. Screams and crying could be heard throughout and moans the family couldn't ignore. Eventually they gave in, dug Anne up, and took off her head. They brought it into the hall and the disturbances, they stopped. But years passed and the ownership of this hall changed. The new owners, they had no interest in a dead girl's skull in their home and got rid of it, but sure enough, just when they did, the noises and the hauntings started again. Over the centuries, people have tried and tried again to rid themselves of this skull many times, but eventually, they always cave and they have to bring it back in. The skull truly is cursed and it must remain inside the home at all times if you ever want any peace from Anne's spirit. Number two on this list is King Tut's statuettes. King Tut's tomb didn't just have one cursed item, it had multiple. His burial mask is pretty widely known, but many don't know the story of two statuettes that also came from this tomb. These were two small bronze statues found inside the tomb. 
One of them with their hand over their heart, and the other one with their hand over their mouth. Lord Carnivon, the man who funded the initial excavation, gave these to a friend as a gift. This was meant to be in good faith and a friendly gesture, but he had no idea the trouble that they would cause. The name of the family is omitted in this story to protect their integrity, and the person who received the statues is simply referred to as James. James received these statues and brought them back to America with him, but then started to suffer the consequences. Once wildly successful, James started to lose everything. His company, his money, his family. James went through three failed marriages, a complete collapse of his immense fortune, and finally died of illness without ever realizing these statues were part of the problem. He left them to his grandson in his will, and the curse continued. When his grandson took hold of these statues, he was a decorated Olympian, but he also suffered a serious fall from grace. Injuries, other accidents, and failed business ventures plagued the grandson from the second that he took hold of these statues until finally he called the museum. He donated them to the museum so that they could be put with some of the other King Tut pieces and the curse could finally be lifted from his family. Now it's certainly possible that this was all a coincidence and this family just got down on their luck at the wrong time. But anything involving King Tut has the potential to be cursed, and I wouldn't be surprised if these statues were part of that. Number one on this list is the Unlucky Mummy. The Unlucky Mummy is an ornate wooden coffin that was found in an ancient Egyptian tomb. This coffin's preservation was remarkable for how old experts thought that it must be. The coffin was said to hold the remains of ancient Egyptian princess Amun-Ra. The legend says that in 1890 some British men stumbled upon this casket at an Egyptian excavation site. There were four men and they all suffered greatly right after coming in contact with this coffin. The first man, who initially took ownership of the coffin, was seen leaving his hotel and walking straight into the desert to never be seen again only after one day of possessing said casket. The second man on the very next day was accidentally shot and had to have his arm amputated. The third man, when they did eventually get back to Britain, returned to see that all of his life savings were gone. And the last man died from disease shortly after the discovery of this artifact. And just like that, the curse of the unlucky mummy began. Now there are some misconceptions with this mummy. Some people believe that the unlucky mummy got put onto the Titanic ship and that's what caused the Titanic to sink. That was never the case though. In fact, once the coffin got to Britain, it's never left. That doesn't mean that this thing isn't still cursed though. It currently resides at the British Museum in London. Since its arrival there, other rumors about this ancient artifact have come out, such as the untimely death of writer Bertram Fletcher Robinson. He was convinced that there was no curse surrounding this coffin. In fact, he even wrote extensively on that topic. But then he died shortly afterwards. Incidents like this have happened all throughout history, further solidifying the curse around this coffin. With everything that's happened to it, the term unlucky might just be a bit of an understatement. Number five on this list is the Die Book Box. This is an evil box that tormented many people and even claimed some lives along the way. Zach Baggins writes, According to Jewish folklore, a diabook is a dark spirit that takes over the bodies of living people and uses them for evil. Legend has it that a diabook can be trapped inside of a box and prevented from causing mischief unless the box is opened, that is. Several years ago, the diabook box came up for sale on eBay. The seller listed a vintage wine cabinet that came from the estate of a woman who survived a world War II concentration camp. The seller, an antique dealer named Kevin Manis, claimed that the first owner's granddaughter was terrified of the box, warning him that her grandmother said it held a diabook. After buying the cabinet, he was plagued by a series of unfortunate events and recurring nightmares of an old hag that would brutally attack him, causing him to wake up with bruises on his body. He also experienced an overpowering stench of cat urine in his home. Tragically, his mother suffered a stroke while opening the box. Not surprisingly, he decided to get rid of it. The box eventually ended up in the hands of Missouri Medical Museum director Jason Haxton, who was skeptical about the powers attributed to the box. He soon changed his mind. After acquiring the box, he began to experience a series of medical maladies, including bleeding eyes and strange rashes. He also began to dream of being attacked by an old hag and would also awake with bruises on his body. Kevin Manis told me that while the 
box was at Haxton's basement, a man died there and his body was found lying next to the box. He eventually became so unnerved by the box that he reached out to scientists and rabbis who instructed him to build a wooden ark lined with 24 karat gold, place the box inside, and bury it in the ground. Now this actually wasn't the end of the story for this box. The box was eventually dug up again and then later donated to a museum. This was after it had tormented a few more people mind you though. Now it's fully encased in a glass covering but even that doesn't stop the evil spirit from coming after people. Many people who have visited this box have reported having serious episodes in the room while they're looking at it. Whatever spirit is trapped inside this box, it is clearly an extremely powerful one. The box remains on display at the museum but I wouldn't recommend going to check it out if I was you. Number 4 on this list is the Devil's Rocking Chair. The Devil's Rocking Chair is actually from one of Ed and Lorraine Warren's most famous case, The Devil Made Me Do It. Zach Baggins writes, The horror began in July 1980 when David Glatzel, 11 years old, became possessed by a demon. One night he woke up screaming, claiming that he had been visited by a man with big black eyes, a thin face with animal features, jagged teeth, pointed ears, horns, and hooves. David was, everyone agreed, not the kind of kid who liked scary movies or who was likely to make things up and he was visibly shaken up by this experience. He became rather withdrawn and quiet. His older sister, Debbie, asked her fiance, Aaron Johnson, if he would stay with her family for a while and see whether it would help David get out of his depression. Aaron, of course, agreed, but things didn't get better. David reported having more nightmares about the terrifying man who promised to take his soul. Odd scratches and bruises began to appear on the boy and all the injuries seemed to happen while he was asleep. Odd sounds, which Arn couldn't explain, were heard in the attic. Worst of all, David began to claim that he was now seeing the beast while he was awake. He was always seen sitting in the family's rocking chair, which the beast now claimed as his own. David was the only one who saw the beast in the chair, but family members often saw it rocking back and forth, seemingly under its own power. This was obviously a lot, so the Warrens were brought in to perform the exorcism. The exorcism took place in that rocking chair, and it's thought that the chair itself still has some evil energy from this spirit attached to it. Now the chair resides at the haunted museum, but owner Zach Beggins actually took the exhibit down because the chair was simply too dangerous, he thought. Number three on this list is the Hope Diamond. Don't get me wrong, guys. I would love to have this thing, but I just don't know if the juice is worth the squeeze here. Google Arts and Culture says, one of the most famous diamonds in the world, the Hope Diamond, originated in the Kular mine in Andhra Pradesh, India. According to the legend the stone is cursed and brings misfortune to anyone who owns it. The curse is said to have come about when the original diamond was stolen from the eye of a statue. The thief met a grisly end, kickstarting a pattern of misfortune for all those who possessed the diamond. Over the years, owners of the Hope Diamond have befallen fates including death by murder, execution, they've taken their own lives, bankruptcy, and imprisonment. Thankfully, the curse seems to have been lifted when the diamond was donated to the Smithsonian in 1958. Now I don't really buy into the fact that this curse is lifted in my opinion. Like literally if you own this diamond then you die or someone you love dies. That's what's happened throughout history. In the best possible case scenario you just get hit with like horrible luck and lose all your money or some other horrible thing. There just really isn't any good way to spin this. Owning the Hope Diamond is pretty much a horrible idea. Number two on this list is the Unlucky Mummy. Do not get on a boat if said boat is also carrying this mummy. Google Arts and Culture says, the unlucky mummy isn't actually a mummy, but the mummy board or coffin lid of a high status woman who lived in around 950 to 900 BCE. Discovered in Thebes in the 1800s, the four young Englishmen who first purchased the mummy all died in unfortunate circumstances. Rumors of the curse soon spread and in the early 20th century, journalist William Thomas Steed wrote an article on the jinxed artifact. Steed went on to be one of the passengers on the doomed Titanic. It's said that he told stories of the curse in the run-up to the disaster, with many believing that the mummy itself caused the ship's watery end. Today, the unlucky mummy is on display in the British Museum. The Titanic was supposed to be unsinkable. Enter in the unlucky mummy, and boom, now the unsinkable ship 
goes down. Maybe it's a stretch to say that this thing caused the literal Titanic crash, but I can at least guarantee that it probably didn't help. At least this thing is now locked up in a museum very much on land and not connected to any boats that I know of. And number one on this list is the Hands Resist Him painting. I'm all about having some cool groundbreaking art, but this painting definitely crosses the line. The lineup says there is no doubt the painting is disturbing. It shows a young boy standing next to a girl doll with hollow eyes and a sad downturned mouth. The doll is holding a strange device with wires coming out of it. The eeriest part of the painting are the many disembodied children's hands reaching toward the boy through the glass panels of a door just behind him. But even more disturbing than the painting itself are the stories of what has happened to people who come in contact with it. A few years after the painting was sold, the art critic Henry Seldes died. Then the gallery owner died. Then in 1984, John Marley died. The painting disappeared, not surfacing again until 2000 in a bizarre posting on eBay. The new owners were trying to sell it because, they said, it was haunted. They claimed the boy and the doll in the picture would fight with each other during the night, terrifying their four-year-old daughter. They set up a motion sensing camera in the room for three nights and claimed they had captured the boy in the picture, leaving the frame and coming into the room, apparently fleeing in terror. The literal kid in the painting is leaving. Not freaking cool. Cool, guys. My paintings are supposed to be static and not moving, and they definitely aren't supposed to be walking around my home scaring the living bejesus out of me and my family. Apparently, this painting is locked up in a storage locker now, and no one is allowed to see it. Number five, my precious. The Vine Ring, or Ring of Sylvanius, is a gold ring dating probably from the 4th century AD, discovered in a plowed field near Silchester in Hampshire, England in 1785. This happens to be the site of many archaeological discoveries, but nothing else seems to be super newsworthy. It is unknown how the ring came to be located at the vine, but it is presumed that the farmer who found the ring sold it to the family, who were known to have an interest in history and antiquities. In 1888, the owner of the property, Shalona Shoot, wrote about the ring in the history of the house. The ring of Sylvianus or Sylvanius, let me know in the comments which pronunciation is right, is larger than most rings, being 1 inch in diameter and weighing 12 grams. The band of the ring has 10 facets and is set with a square bezel engraved with an image of the goddess Venus. To one side are the letters VE and to the other side NVS in mirror writing. The band is inscribed with the words Sinisiane vivas in de. I tried. In 1929, the archaeologist Sir Mortimer Wheeler was excavating the Lydney site and made a connection between between the ring, bearing the name of Sinisianus, and the cursed stone, bearing the same name. We either called upon J.R.R. Tolkien as professor of Anglo-Saxon at Oxford University to investigate the uh, etymology of the name Nodens referred to in the curse. So uh, remember Lord of the Rings? Well. This is the ring that inspired it. Sylvianus loses his gold ring at Lydney as Gollum lost his under the Misty Mountains. Uh, Sylvianus believes his ring has been stolen by someone whose name he knows. Sinisianus, just as Gollum thinks his ring has been stolen by Bilbo Baggins. Sylvianus curses by name the person he suspects, and similarly, when Gollum works out that Bilbo has found and kept his ring, he cries out in rage, Thief! 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 Baggins! We hates it! We hates it! We hates it forever! That's also just me when I wake up in the morning. Both Gollum and Sylvianus know the identity of the persons they regard as thieves who have stolen their gold rings, and both declare these names with maledictions. Roman tablets were found to contain references to the artifact, informing the god Nodens that the ring had been stolen. In the tablet, the former owner of the ring proclaims that whoever has taken the ring shall find themselves in bad health until it's given back to its owner. As it was written, for the god Nodens, Sylvianus has lost a ring and has donated one half of its worth to Nodens. Among those named Sinisianus, permit no good health until it is returned to the temple of Nodens. So Nodens is a cognate of the old Irish Nuada Argitlem, first king of Tuatha de Danann, who is disqualified from ruling Ireland because he lost his hand in battle. Nodens has also been associated with the Fisher King of Arthurian legends, the Norse god Njord of the Vanir, who is the god of wine, fishing, sailing, and fertile land along the sea coast, and the Roman god Mars. By all accounts, Nodens could be a rascally deity and well inclined to help with a curse, you know? I thought, you know, maybe put that thing back where it came from. 
or so help me. Currently it's in a museum somewhere, but thankfully not on display. An exact location is also unknown, which that's a win in my book. Number four, a copy of Crying Boy. So when Bob Smith was a young person in the 70s, he became fascinated by a painting in his grandmother's house. It was a cheap print of a well-known piece and was hung on the living room wall. The photo depicted a boy who was similar age to Bob and for some reason looked sad and downcast with tears brimming from his troubled eyes. A few years after the painting went up on the wall, there was a devastating kitchen fire in the house. And while the kitchen was destroyed, the rest of the house was undamaged. Now the painting was eventually sold in a garage sale to Ed Warren. You know that name. I know you know that name. For years it puzzled Bob why his grandmother got rid of the painting until he read a series of articles about a curse painting, which was, yep. The Crying Boy. So The Crying Boy was one in a series of paintings by artist Giovanni Bregolin that was completed in the 1950s. In total, Giovanni painted over 60 paintings, and up until the early 80s, prints and reprints of his images continued to be mass produced. In 1985, the most popular tabloid newspaper in the United Kingdom printed a story that caused panic and ended the popularity of his work. The Sun published an article entitled Blazing Curse of the Crying Boy, describing the terrible experience of May and Ron Hall after their home was destroyed by fire. The cause of the fire much like Bob's grandma's, was a greasy pan that overheated and burst into flames and spread rapidly and destroyed everything on the ground floor. Only one item remained intact, Prince of the Crying Boy on their living room wall. Distraught at their loss, the devastated couple made the bizarre claim that the painting was cursed and it, not the pan, was the cause of the fire. Now this tale probably would have disappeared into the archives of strange and mysterious stories, except for one teeny tiny thing. A firefighter claimed that he had attended at least 15 house fires where everything was destroyed, except for prints of the crying boy, which would remain completely intact. Before long, the story gathered momentum, and a rash of fires all over the world were blamed on the cursed boy. When the Sun reported that even rational firefighters refused to have a copy of the crying boy in their homes, the reputation of the painting was damned forever. In all these cases, and many more that were reported, the paintings of the crying boy remained unharmed. Now most copies were burned in a massive bonfire held by the Sun newspaper and led by professional firefighters, but to this day, a few copies still exist and I'm just gonna steer clear of those places. Now I haven't heard of any of them being officially on display, which, whew, great relief. Number three, a vase you'll want to break. So for centuries, a common wedding gift given to brides of royalty and wealth were intricate and expensive vases. Back in the 12th century, you know, the Duchess Eleanor of Aquitaine gifted her husband-to-be, King Louis VIII, you know, a raw crystal vase. So, you know, it wasn't unusual when a woman in the 15th century received a vase as a wedding gift, but it was just kind of silver and plain looking. There was no intricate markings, no lavish decorations, and it didn't really appear to be expensive, but this particular vase contained a curse that would continue to take lives for the next five centuries. Not much is known about the woman who originally received the vase way back when, other than her wedding took place in a northern village close to Napoli, Italy. The stories say she didn't know who gifted her the four pound silver vase, but took it to her room for safekeeping just to be on the safe side. And when the wedding was about to start, she was nowhere to be found. Her husband-to-be searched for her and found her in her room, lying on the ground, clutching the vase with a fierce grip before passing away just moments later. After her funeral, the Bassano vase was given to one of her family members for safekeeping, but within days they were also dead. At the time, no one thought the vase was the cause and it was given to another family member to hold. Anyone wanna guess what happened next? Yeah, you guessed it. Days later, they were dead as well. The family finally put two and two together and reached out to a priest for guidance under the belief that whoever gifted the bride the vase put a curse on it or had it made with cursed materials and were instructed to bury it on sacred grounds. Many believe it was buried near the same church where the priest resided, but it's not exactly known where it was buried as the vase steered clear of history books for around 500 years. In 1988, an unnamed man happened to dig up the vase in Italy and within it found a note reading, beware, this vase brings death, and go figure he ignored the note, tossing it away and brought the vase to an auction house, a classic case of those who ignore history being forced to repeat it. It was sold to a local pharmacist for the equivalent of 2,270 USD in today's money. Three months later, the pharmacist had passed and his family sold the vase to a 37-year-old doctor who also passed away soon after. Anyone else getting a lovely case of deja vu? At that point, the vase started gaining a reputation and no one was willing to purchase it, minus a single archaeologist, who three months later died from an unknown and mysterious infection. Distraught and afraid, the family of the archaeologist tossed the vase out of a window, where a cop found it and tried passing it off to multiple museums, none of which wanted to publicly accept it, but legend says that one did and buried it amongst their archives for safety. Number two, James Dean's car. Actor James Dean loved his 1955 Porsche Spider, having had it extensively customized, and he affectionately called it his little bastard. 
Apparently the car was so transparently evil that Sir Alec Guinness, when meeting Dean for lunch one day, claimed, if you get in that car, you will be found dead in it by this time next week. Now Dean laughed it off and set about preparing the car for the sports car races with his mechanic Rolf Witherich. Enlisting stuntman Bill Hickman to help out, the original plan was to tow Little B to the races, but Rolf felt that it would be better for Dean to get used to the spider and run the engine in. On that fateful Friday, Rolf sat next to Dean, while Hickman followed with his truck and trailer. Police pulled over the convoy and issued a pair of speeding tickets just outside Bakersfield, but that didn't slow Dean down one bit. Dean was barreling down Route 466 at an estimated 85 miles per hour when a young Cal Poly student named Donald Turnupspeed, driving a Ford Tudor, uh, decided to make a sudden turn onto Route 41. The impact sent the Ford almost 40 feet down the road and ejected Rolf from the Porsche. Dean was pronounced dead on arrival at the Paso Robles War Memorial Hospital at 6.20 p.m. But hey, the curse didn't stop there. When mechanics tried to repair the wrecked car, it fell on one of them, crushing both of his legs. Dr. William Eskrich bought the Porsche from a salvage yard in Burbank and proceeded to strip it for parts. He installed the Porsche's engine into his Lotus race car, then loaned the transmission and suspension parts to a fellow doctor and racer, Troy McHenry. Dr. William crashed the Lotus at the 19 1956 Pomona sports car races, surviving, but McHenry wasn't as lucky. He hit a tree and was killed in the same race, and so the curse of Little B gained strength. Two thieves who tried to take pieces of the car were both injured, and uh, the Porsche itself carried on. Shortly after the crash, publicity monger and self-proclaimed King of Customs with a K, George Barris bought the Spider, or what was left of it, promising to rebuild it. When the mangled frame was found to be beyond recovery, he chose to capitalize on the car's notoriety. The Porsche was loaned to the Los Angeles chapter of the National Safety Council, and from 1957 to 59, it went on a gruesome tour of car shows, movie theaters, and bowling alleys. In March of 1959, while in storage in Fresno, the car mysteriously caught fire. It suffered remarkably little damage, you know, just two melted tires and some singed paint, and fortunately the fire didn't spread to the other vehicles in storage. Meanwhile, Barris had sold a pair of tires from the car and both repeatedly blew at the same time, causing the new owner to, you know, veer off the road. Little B even managed to crush and kill a truck driver who was transporting it. The car has since disappeared into a museum archive, which is probably for the best. I'm nervous just around regular cars, but the thought of this cursed monstrosity is making me extra jittery. Or, you know, that might be from the second energy drink I had a moment ago. Number one, don't open the box. In Jewish folklore, a debuk is an evil spirit. Supposedly, a Holocaust survivor accidentally summoned this demon while using a homemade Ouija board, but managed to trap it inside the wine cabinet. Okay, I'm just gonna back up and unpack that for a moment. Somebody summoned something evil with a Ouija board, sealed it in something else, and people keep trying to awaken it? Let sleeping demons lie for crying out loud. Kevin Manis bought the box at an estate sale in 2001 and immediately started having nightmares about an evil hag. Ditto for the friends who were staying with him. Now, he gave the box to his mother, who suffered a stroke on the same day. The box's later owners have also claimed that the spirit within has appeared in their nightmares as well. The last owner was Jason Haxton, director of the Museum of Osteopathic Medicine, who not only had nightmares, but developed a strange skin disease and began coughing up red fluid. Now, at that point, he contacted his local rabbis, sealed the demon back in the box, and then hid it from the world with help from a museum archivist friend. Number five on this list is the Treaties of the Vessels. The year is 1981. Harrison Ford has already taken the big screen a few times, but is he a leading actor? Yes, Raiders of the Lost Ark takes to the screen and the beautiful George Lucas and Steven Spielberg brainchild officially solidifies Harrison Ford as being an elite A-lister in Hollywood. Well, this beautiful brainchild of theirs didn't just come out of thin air, but it was very likely inspired by the treaties of the vessels. This text is set to talk about some priceless treasures from King Solomon along with the Ark of the Covenant. If found, these would be some of the most valuable things ever rediscovered in all of human history. When there's gold, people are going to come, and the same thing applies here. There are riches galore to be found if someone is able to get to the bottom of this mystery and the secrets may be within the treaties of the vessels. The thing is, it doesn't tell you the exact location of the Ark, so our daring explorers will need to find out for themselves. In case you didn't know, the Ark of the Covenant is said to hold tablets containing the Ten Commandments. The rest of the treasure is described in the treaties as being 77 tables of gold and their gold was from the walls of the Garden of Eden that was revealed to Solomon. And they radiated like the radiance of the sun and moon which radiate at the height of the world. So yeah, it's all pretty freaking good stuff. 
Although, I don't know if y'all remember the end of Harrison Ford's massive breakout movie, but discovering the Ark of the Covenant may not be the best thing ever. In fact, it's said that touching the Ark of the Covenant will result in death by the hands of God. That's why some people think this whole thing is cursed. Yes, if you actually found this thing, then you might be the most wealthy person in the world, but it may also kill you in the process. You also may never find it at all and dedicate your life to nothing. I'd say that you can probably read this thing, just leave the exploring to our main man Indy. Number 4 on this list is the Voynich Manuscript. The Voynich Manuscript is definitely an interesting one, largely because no one has any idea what it's saying. This is a 250 page book where pretty much all of the words are in an unfamiliar language that we can't seem to decipher. The reason that people think this thing is inherently cursed isn't just because of the gibberish though, it's because of the pictures that go along with said gibberish. Cosmological symbols, weird plants doing weird things, and nude women doing some other weird things are all over this book. It should also be stated that the manner of the drawings are just plain creepy. Like there's nothing inherently evil or cursed about a plant or a naked woman, but the way that the book has drawn them out really does give me some serious devil vibes. Because of this, people worry that the book may be cursed. That potentially this is a book from the underworld which somehow made its way to our world. This is why we can't understand the words, but a demon would be able to pick it up no problem. Experts have researched the language and although they don't know what it is, have discovered some hallmarks that indicate it is a real language of some kind. Therefore, it could be some kind of demonic tongue that we aren't familiar with. Granted, it could also be some other ancient language that's just been lost in time. Demonic language or ancient language, I think based on the drawings, it's clear that whatever is said is probably not PG stuff. Who knows how many gruesome or questionable things this book has been part of in its lifetime. Considering you wouldn't be able to read it anyways, I'd just avoid it altogether. Number 3 on this list is the Handbook of Ritual Power. Anything called the Handbook of Ritual Power probably deserves to be on the list. Owen Jarvis details this book nicely by writing, This 20 page codex dates back around 1300 years and is written in Coptic. It contains a variety of magical spells and formulas including love spells, spells for curing black jaundice, and instructions on how to perform an exorcism. The text may have been written by a group of Sethians, an ancient Christian sect who held Seth, the third son of Adam and Eve, in high regard. The opening of the text references a mysterious figure named Bakhtiotha whose identity is unknown. I give thanks to you and I call upon you, the Bakhtiotha, the great one who is very untrustworthy, the one who is lord over the forty and the nine kinds of serpents, a translation of the text reads. The researchers who translated and analyzed the text call it a handbook of ritual power. It is now housed at the Museum of Ancient Cultures at Macquarie University in Sydney. The university purchased the codex in 1981 from a Vienna based antiquities dealer named Michael Fackelman, where Fackelman got it from is unknown. Spells, formulas, black jaundice, all of this sounds quite a lot like some of the other books that we've looked at in the first two parts of this series. A book that probably teaches humans some skills that we simply aren't ready to receive. A book that if it fell into the wrong hands, somebody with evil intentions, could prove to be really really bad. There are things that need to be left in the hands of higher beings and making somebody fall in love with someone else may just be one of them. Keep this book locked up and away from prying eyes. Number 2 on this list is the Dresden Codex. Owen Jarvis details once again the Dresden Codex beautifully by writing, The Dresden Codex is a Mayan text dating back around 800 years. It contains 39 beautifully illustrated sheets with texts and images on both sides. Research published in 2016 in the Journal of Astronomy and Culture indicates that the Codex records the phases of the planet Venus so that the Maya would be certain that their ceremonial events were being held on the correct day. The Maya had a really elaborate ritual set of events that were tied to the calendar. Study researcher Geraldo Aldana, a science historian at the University of California, Santa Barbara, told Live Science. They were probably doing large scale ritual activities connected to the different phases of Venus. Now, for those who don't know, Venus, albeit a very beautiful planet, is often tied to Lucifer. 
It should also be noted that the Mayans were known to perform the occasional human sacrifice, and I don't think it's a stretch to say that this text most likely contains dates when human sacrifices are to be performed. The Dresden Codex would have acted as an agenda to make sure that our Mayans kept on track with their sacrificial rituals to honor Venus. For this reason, it's thought that this codex is cursed with the souls of those who were sacrificed. It's also very dangerous to perform any of these rituals as they will likely involve the loss of human life and potentially reaching out to some very dangerous gods. This is the oldest surviving Maya book and for that reason needs to be kept around for research, but I wouldn't recommend the average person giving it a read. And finally, number one on this list is Liber Linatus. This text is currently considered to be the longest lasting Etruscan text in all of history. It dates back to the 3rd century BCE, and because not much is known about the Etruscan language, it remains mostly untranslated. However, experts who study such things have been able to decipher some of it and have discovered that the text was a ritual calendar. A collection of dates with specific rituals to be performed on said dates. The exact details of these rituals are unknown, but we assume them to be centered around human sacrifices and things of that nature. This is already enough to fear this book, but what makes it inherently cursed is how the pages were used for several thousand years. Mihailo Beric was a low-ranking Croatian official who, in 1848, decided to leave his position and travel to Egypt. While he was there, he decided to purchase a sarcophagus with a mummy inside. Why someone would want a coffin with a preserved dead body in it is beyond me, but apparently this was pretty cool to own back then. Anyways, he takes this mummy back to his home in Vienna and stands it upright in the corner of one of his rooms. It wasn't until after he died though and his brother donated the mummy to the State Institute of Croatia that somebody realized what the mummy was covered with. The bandages that preserved the mummy were covered in writing. These bandages were the Liber Linatus and had been used as rags for this mummy for centuries. Now this text is locked in a refrigerated room in the Archaeological Museum of Croatia and for good reason. Not only is the writing of this text potentially very dangerous, but people believe that the spirit of this dead mummy haunts the rags and that they're cursed. Those that come into contact with them, or God forbid read them, could have some very tragic events befall them. For this reason, I highly recommend staying away from the Liber Linatus at all costs. Number five, the Great Bed of Ware. Located in the Victoria and Albert Museum, the Great Bed of Ware has become infamous for its dark, twisted history. Constructed in 1850, the bed was created as a tourist attraction for an inn in Ware. The four-poster bed is over three meters wide and is the only known example of a bed this size. It's been said that it is able to accommodate at least four couples, minimum. Eight people, wow. <laughs> Guests would carve their initials into the wood or apply red wax seals to commemorate their stay and leave their mark on the bed. The marks are still visible on the bed to this day. The bed's carving is typical for the late Elizabethan period with ornamental ribbon-like patterns, lions and satyrs to symbolize fertility and virility. By 1931, the bed became the single most expensive item of furniture, specifically a single piece of furniture opposed to a set. According to legend, the carpenter who made the bed was so enraged by the disrespectful treatment of his work that his ghost attacked any commoner who slept in it. And you know, the carpenter made the bed for a king and then traveling commoners slept in it and carved their names all over. I'd be kind of upset too, like he must have believed the bed was going to be treated a lot differently than it actually was. The bed he had made for a king was instead damaged and covered in graffiti. The bed is now on display in Britain and you are able to visit it, but luckily for both you and the carpenter's ghost, no one is able to sleep in the bed now. Number four, the Terracotta Army. The Terracotta Army is a collection of terracotta sculptures that depict the armies of Qin Shi Huang, the first emperor of China. You know, the one that searched for immortality and ate mercury in an attempt to live forever. Yeah, that one. The statues are a form of art that were buried along with Qin Shi, with the purpose of protecting him in his afterlife. The statues were first discovered in 1974 by a group of local farmers. The figures varied in height according to their rank, the tallest being the generals. The figures included warriors, chariots, and horses. There were three pits which held over 8,000 soldiers, 130 chariots with 520 horses, and 150 cavalry horses. Most were 
found in the mausoleum for Kinshi, but there were also some found in nearby pits that weren't directly in his massive underground grave. The village that the farmers were from believed that if they disturbed the army, they would receive misfortune and bouts of bad luck. Their suspicions were sadly correct, seeing as their 2,000 year old village was destroyed in order to create an enormous museum over the area. I mean, I'd say that's less misfortune and more human idiocy. Just leave well enough alone. You don't need to make everything a spectacle. The extravagant funeral art is available for observation in the museum, and pieces of the army have been sent all over the world. But you should definitely think twice before deciding to visit the exhibit. Bad luck and misfortune are definitely able to spread to curious onlookers. Guys, I know I usually tell you to stay curious, but if you come across someone's funeral art, don't be curious. Turn around and pretend like you never saw it. It's like if you decided to unearth someone's coffin just because you thought it was cool. It's weird. That would be a weird, disrespectful thing to do. Number three, the Hope Diamond. The Hope Diamond is one of the most famous diamonds in the world. The diamond originated in the Kollar mine in Andhra Pradesh, India. The history of the stone began when a French merchant traveler purchased the diamond, which was triangular in shape and crudely cut. He described the color as a beautiful violet. The stone was then sold to King Louis along with 14 other large diamonds and many smaller ones. The stone was then recut by the court jeweler. It was described by them as an intense steely blue, and the stone became known as the blue diamond of the crown, or the French blue. It was set in gold and hung from a neck ribbon, which was worn by the king on ceremonial occasions. The next king got the diamond reset, and then when he and Marie Antoinette attempted to escape France in 1792, the diamond was stolen after being seized by the government. The stone was passed on to many, many people, being set in different jewelry and headpieces. Eventually, the stone would be displayed in several exhibitions for people to view worldwide. In 1958, the diamond was donated to the Smithsonian, quickly becoming the main attraction. Since its donation, the stone has only left the premises four times. Once to the Louvre, once to South Africa at the Rand Easter Show opening, once to Harry Winston, and one other time to clean and restore the diamond. According to legend, the stone is cursed and will bring bad luck and misfortune to any anyone who owns it. The curse is said to have come about when the original diamond was stolen from the eye of a statue. The thief who originally stole the stone met a grisly end, and owners of the diamond over the years have followed the same fate, being beheaded, executed, imprisoned, turned bankrupt, and many of their lives have ended abruptly at their own hands and often at someone else's. Since the diamond reached the Smithsonian, there have been no reports of the curse's effects, but I would suggest the the only reason for that is no one wears it. I mean, if I got the chance, I have to say, I'd wear it. The thing is beautiful, and I would leave this life happy knowing that I had millions of dollars strapped around my neck, glittering and shining in a vibrant blue. Number two, Unlucky Mummy. The Unlucky Mummy is an ancient Egyptian artifact owned by the famous colonizers, the British. More specifically, it lies within the halls of the British Museum. The identity of the original owner is unknown. The the artifact is described as a painted wooden mummy board of an unidentified woman and was obtained by the British Museum in 1889. The unlucky mummy is actually not a mummy at all. Instead, it is a gessoed and painted wooden inner coffin lid. It was found at Thebes and has been dated by its shape and style of decoration to the late 21st or the early 22nd dynasty. It is 162 centimeters in length and made of wood and plaster. The paint is placed on the plaster and hands protrude out of the mummy board. A nice 3D moment, you know? Its reputation for misfortune has been told for years, and many attribute large-scale disasters to the presence of the board. One story says the mummy was being moved from the British Museum to New York aboard the, yep, the Titanic, which, as you know, sank. Disclaimers surrounding the mummy's danger have even been published. One writer even conducted research into the history of the artifact, coming to the conclusion that the object had malevolent powers, and guess what? He passed away only three years later. The writer was very young and had no health concerns. His life ended at the mere age of 36. 
The mummy which the board belonged to has never been found, but many say that it was left in Egypt. I have to say, people keep taking things that don't belong to them, disturbing bodies that had been left undisturbed for thousands of years, and then they act all surprised when the stuff is cursed. I definitely put a curse on the lid of my coffin. Anyone who separates me and my coffin lid, or even pick me up from my resting place to move me into a fluorescent hellscape, would definitely be sentenced to a fate of mediocrity and ignorant greed. Wait, oh my gosh. Anyone who does that is already both of those things. Things are starting to make a lot more sense now. Honestly, I love history, but at the same time, no I don't. I don't need to know the genetic makeup of people 2,000 years ago. That won't help me. People just need to chill on the grave digging. Add that to the list of the top five weirdest, most unsettling things humans do. I could definitely make a highly controversial and opinionated video on that, which would likely get me canceled. It would also be like two hours long. <laughs> Number one, Cursed Ledger. A family in Kent donated this haunted book to Brighton's most haunted house, Preston Manor. They donated it after they were plagued by spectral visions and paranormal visitors. The shop ledger is from 1915, but was found trapped in the brick wall at a jeweler while a demolition was being performed in the 1980s. It was discovered by Tony Benjovitz in 1988 when he was demolishing the Shoreland Fuchs shop, which had closed in 1984. He, for some reason, decided to bring the book home and it caused him and his daughter to suffer a myriad of paranormal hauntings, which they described as spirit visitations. His daughter, Josephine, claimed that images appeared in her rug, including a group of men, women, and children, and a soldier with a horse. She said that the spirits told her that the book had to be returned to Brighton for the anniversary of its first entry in December of 1980. The spirit's requests caused Josephine to phone Preston Manor, who sent a medium to visit the house. The medium confirmed that they sensed bad things emanating from it. Wow, specific. Josephine happily donated the ledger to the manor. She had no interest in keeping it to herself or even keeping it in her possession. Fair, I mean, I don't think I would want to keep it either, to be honest. The manor recalled their thoughts about the book, saying, at first, we weren't sure whether we'd take this apparently ordinary 100-year-old shop ledger, but the family impressed on us quite how scared they were of having the book in their keeping. When I had a phone conversation with Josephine, she seemed petrified. The book contained entries listed the jewelry sold from the shop it belonged to. After the book had been donated, Kent, the officer of Preston Manor, kept the ledger on her desk for a couple of weeks, but was unable to understand what exactly had happened to the book. Preston Manor holds several haunted items and is well known for the plethora of ghosts and spectral activities it contains. If you're a fan of getting haunted by the Lady in White or the Grey Lady, those are descriptive names, then you should definitely consider taking a trip to Brighton and Hove, East Sussex, to visit Preston Manor. They absolutely have their share of Victorian ghosts and haunted artifacts. Definitely a lot for the paranormal enthusiasts of the world to enjoy.